Hello everyone and welcome to the reflection for Sunday the 24th of October. It's been a couple of weeks since I've seen you so I hope you're doing well. Um, I had a nice short holiday which was fantastic and I spent some time with Toby so that was uh, made a big difference absolutely and we went to the Peak District and explored that a little so uh, good times that we had together. Back to work uh, with a vengeance and lots and lots to do of course. Uh, the good news for those of you that have been following the Reed saga, our family saga, is that our daughter Becky and her husband Alex finally get to go on their honeymoon today. They fly out from Saudi Arabia at nine o'clock tonight and they're going to the States, to America. Uh, five weeks they've got a uh, honeymoon in America, mostly, most of it at Disney World. So uh, I hope they're going to have lots and lots of fun. But uh, next month they celebrate their second wedding anniversary. So um, this honeymoon has been postponed and postponed and postponed. So uh, they are very relieved that they're finally going to get um, to enjoy that time together. So that's the good news. So turning our attention then to this Sunday. A large part of my ministry over many, many years has included praying with and for people. However, what I have discovered is that most people know exactly what they would like me to pray for. So usually before I begin, I ask that simple question. What would you like me to pray for? In today's Bible passage, passage, Jesus asks a similar question of a blind beggar. What do you want me to do for you? I think this question is hugely significant. For if Jesus himself did not assume to know how to meet the needs of this man who found himself on the margins of his society, then maybe those of us who seek to help those on the margins of our own society first need to ask the question, what do you want me to do for you? It's interesting isn't it in our churches when we talk about outreach and we talk about mission and serving our communities how often do we try new initiatives without actually asking the question what do our communities want us to do for them it sounds simple but we often think we know the answer so let's read Today's scripture, I'm reading from the Gospel of Mark, and it's Mark chapter 10, verses 46 to 52. So if you have your Bible there and you like to read along, compare your translation to mine, then please turn now to the Gospel of Mark. At the beginning of the New Testament, we have Matthew and then Mark. Mark chapter 10. And just to catch you out, I'm going to read today from the New Revised Standard Version. The very Bible that I was given when I was ordained. So reading from Mark 10, beginning at verse 46. They came to Jericho. As he and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, son of David. Have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. 
and they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, My teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. So when we talk about meeting the needs of those on the margins, I'm going to offer you two examples amongst many that I have that have struck a chord with me during my ministry so far. First, a lady. A lady who had dementia, but was still able, with support, to function reasonably well. I visited her at home, and her daughter was telling me about the groups that her mum had been attending. Groups that were specifically aimed at those with dementia. One of these groups involved singing, and this was the lady's comments to me. I hated singing before I had dementia, so why would I want to do it now? No one, of course, had asked her whether she actually liked, enjoyed or wanted to take part in a singing group. It was assumed that it would be good for her. The second example was a very distressed elderly gentleman in a care home whom I knew really well. After a long and honest chat, I asked him if he would like me to pray for him and he said yes. There were many things that I could have prayed. Perhaps that he would settle quickly, that he would make friends, etc. But instead, I asked him what he would like me to pray for. That God will take me quickly, he said. And of course, I prayed what he wanted God to do. These two individuals are the voices of the marginalised and their situations throw up a few challenging questions for us. Do we actually hear the voices of the marginalised or do we totally ignore them? Do we see them but not hear them? Do we assume that we know what they need? And in our kindness and our desire to help, do we forget to ask, what do you want me to do for you? Maybe as a church, as well as individuals, we need to ponder this Bible passage as we seek to serve and reach out into our communities. The story of blind Bartimaeus is the last healing recorded in the Gospel of Mark. Jesus and his disciples are travelling. They're travelling towards Jerusalem for the Passover. In Jericho, the last stop on the pilgrimage route to the city of David, they become part of a much larger crowd, but their journey is unexpectedly delayed by a blind beggar. Unusually, we are told his name, Bartimaeus. Most of the individuals healed by Jesus in the Gospels remain nameless, but here we are not only told his name, but we're also told that he is the son of Timaeus. He is someone's son, says Jesus. In other words, Bartimaeus is a valued human being, not a faceless nobody. But he is poor, disabled, 
and sitting by the roadside. He literally sits on the margins of his society. And although being at the roadside gives him some visibility, the passing pilgrims take little notice and they show even less concern. But he hears that Jesus is coming and he knows about Jesus and he knows about Jesus's powers of healing. And so he shouts, for this is something that he can do. He shouts and he shouts loudly, trying to draw attention to himself. The more the crowds attempt to silence him, the louder he shouts and his perseverance pays off for his cries bring the journeying Jesus to a halt. Perhaps his success in attracting Jesus' attention reminds us of others in Mark's Gospel. Maybe the man that was lowered through the roof by his friends, or the noisy garrison possessed man banished to live amongst the tombs. Or perhaps the bleeding woman who touched the hem of Jesus' robe in a crowded marketplace. These and many more like them were in a similar situation to Bartimaeus. All were marginal people, unwelcome and excluded. Did you notice the detail in the story? For when Jesus stops and calls and says, call him here, Bartimaeus jumps up and throws off his cloak. A seated blind beggar would spread his cloak over his legs and his feet so that he would be able to feel as well as hear any coins thrown into it and be able to retrieve those coins easily. Bartimaeus's faith in Jesus is such that he abandons his cloak, knowing he will no longer require it. Then those all-important words from Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? My teacher, let me see again, Jesus says. Sorry, Jesus didn't say that at all. My teacher, let me see again, Bartimaeus says. And Jesus responds, go, your faith has made you well. Immediately, he regained his sight and followed Jesus on the way. Bartimaeus has now been reinstated into society. He joins the throng of pilgrims on their way to Jerusalem for the Passover. Jesus has made him well. He has received healing and salvation. He can see, yes, he can see, but not merely in the physical sense. Healing always involves spiritual healing and wholeness. For me, as I revisit this passage, which I have studied before, but as I revisit it, it throws up some specific questions for us as members of the Methodist Church today. I wonder, who are the marginalised who put their faith in the church and have not been made well? Who is it that we ignore? The past cases review carried out in 2015 revealed a shaming legacy of abuse within our own Methodist church. And even today, some churches are still reluctant to respond to our mandated safeguarding training and procedures that are designed to ensure that our churches can be safe spaces where all are heard all are valued, all are enabled to take their place. Jesus stopped at the place where the man was and offered a listening voice. Only after hearing 
did Jesus minister to Bartimaeus's needs? Where then within the ministry of the Methodist Church do we meet the marginalised and listen first and then respond? This passage gives us much to think about, doesn't it? Especially as we try to grow our churches and engage with those who live in our towns and our villages. Certainly makes us think. Amen. So it's been good to share with you once again and I will see you again next week. So in the meantime, take good care of yourselves and stay safe. God bless.